that the difference between having a job and having a vocation. My topic this morning is calculation and socialism. Is that a job is some unpleasant work you do in order to make money, with the sole purpose of making money. Do you think in our lifetimes, in, or in our children's lifetime, it's feasible that we figure out a way in some way to, I'm, I'm not endorsing like taking people's money and giving it to other people, but in some sort of a way to eliminate poverty. Is that even possible? Yeah. Is it ever going to be yeah. possible to completely eliminate poverty worldwide and within like a lifetime? But I mean, this is the implication of much of what we talked about here. If you, if you imagine building the perfect labor-saving technology, right, where you ima- imagine just having a machine that can build any machine that can do any human labor, you know, powered by sunlight, more or less for the cost of raw materials, right? Hmm. Right, so you're, you're talking about the ultimate wealth generation device. And now we're not just talking about blue collar labor, we're talking about the kind of labor you and I do, right? So, like the artistic labor and scientific labor. <laughs> And, um, you know, just a machine that comes up with good ideas, right? So we're we're talking about general artificial intelligence. Um, This, if in the right political and economic system, this would just cancel any need for people to have to work to survive. If the structure of our society, meaning, of course, the structure of our economy, does not change dramatically. And such changes, again, are no longer an issue of ideology. Right? It just would be, there'd be enough of everything to go around. And then the question would be, do we have the right political and economic system where we, where we actually could spread that wealth? Or would we, just, would, would we just find ourselves in some kind of horrendous arms race and, and uh, a situation of, of wealth inequality unlike any we've ever seen? One of the great myths of this model is that it is centrally planned. What this means based on historical precedent is that it is assumed that an elite group of people basically will make the economic decisions. I think most people on the planet know that there's something very wrong with the current socioeconomic tradition for a society. Uh, what can Marxism contribute to our modern day world by our It can contribute Venezuela. And it ha- and- no, this model is a collaborative design system, CDS, not centrally planned. It is based entirely upon public interaction facilitated by programmed open source systems that enable a constant dynamic feedback flow that can literally allow the input of the public on any given industrial matter, whether personal or social. It, it can contribute Venezuela. And it, ha- and it has. <laughs> Inequality is really, systemically speaking, the leading cause of death on this planet. There's an overpopulation crisis in certain countries and, in, and disproportionately in the developing world. And there is underpopulation in the developed world. I mean, they're, they're, most of Western Europe is not replacing itself. This isn't an argument towards what's good or bad or right or wrong, I should say. This- We've seen what it can contribute. I don't know how many bloody times we have to run the experiment. This isn't, this isn't uh, freeing people from something. This isn't a Marxist perspective. No, that wasn't real Marxism. I know what that means. I know what that sentence means. What that means is, well, if I was the dictator. This is an issue of public health and what is required to keep society with some form of stability as we approach 9 billion people by 2050. Everything I've heard about population recently is, suggests that we are on course, you know, globally to peak around 9.5 billion and then taper off. As we approach 9 billion people by 2050. I don't, I don't think anyone now is forecasting this totally unsustainable growth where we're going to wind up with, did I say a million? 9.5 billion people. You said billion. Uh, billion. Um, where we're going to, you know, hit something like 20 billion people with my profound understanding of Marx's real intent and that ultimately is the new human rights movement and my universal benevolent compassion we are breaking it up into little bits whereas in fact it is not a lot of little bits 
uncontaminated by any proclivity towards darkness or sin. A movement to change the structure of our society, to improve our well-being before it's too late. I would bring on the socialist utopia. That's what it means, fundamentally. And if someone says that and claims it, then you should get the hell away from them as fast as you possibly can. Thank you. Is we are making a very, very abstract model of the way in which that line is shaped or in which that flea is crawling. But by treating it in this way, as if it were broken up into bits, we are measuring it, we are making a maya, and these cross lines are a maya just in the same way as the idea of the lion, the Leo constellation in the stars is a maya. A way of projecting. You see, this thing, it comes out of our minds, and we project it upon nature like this, and break nature into bits so that it can be easily talked about and handled. It is a continuous sweep. Everything, almost everything, takes resources to produce, right? Well, you say right. everything takes resources to, to build, uh, yes, but money is not a resource. Why is money not a resource? We must recognize, then, that money is a pure abstraction. Because money is not real. It's invented, it's a belief, it's a, it's a religion. We don't need money to, to build a house. We need materials, we need resources. Money never built anything. I was on a television show a little while ago with um, Ted Sorensen and Raymond Moley, and they were having a long, long discussion which sounded like something that goes on in a smoke-filled back room of uh, party bosses, where they were talking about the prospects for the Republican Democratic parties in 1968. And then they got onto the question of automation and the problems of unemployment that it was making and the difficulties of transferring workers from this to that when they were only trained for this. Finally, I said, the trouble with you gentlemen is you still think money is real. And they looked at me and sort of said, oh, 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 someone who doesn't think money is real, because every now anybody knows money is money and it's very important. And so because you do not have, you no longer have this necessary information, you just, you, all you have to do is, all you can do is just guess at what the necessary information is. This was called the impossibility thesis. Because of the fact that only subjective values actually exist, the only way which we can have some kind of objective value is by basing it off of the intersubjective valuations of everyone in the entire economy. These are the basic rules of industrial action set by natural law, not human opinion. That's what a market price is. A market price is a reflection of the exchange of private property that takes place within a market. And so you, you respond, we don't need it now if we can go through the abundance technology. Right, because if... Scarcity, you right, don't need to have this price. Right. Because money comes with the price, a value that you can all come to an agreement right. on based on supply and right. demand. And, and if I can use automation to make billions of tomatoes... Okay. Well, minimize anything with emerging scarcity. But uh, it just isn't real at all, because it has the same relationship to real wealth, that is to say, to actual goods and services, that words have to meaning, that words have to the physical world. And as words are not the physical world, money is not wealth. Economic organization and calculation. Okay. Then there's no need to trade tomatoes anymore. So okay. if I can apply that to everything else along okay. the line, then that's where it washes out. But how could you find out the urgency of need for engineering and steel in other uses? The computer-aided and engineering design process obviously does not exist in a vacuum. Processing demands input from the natural resources that we have. We have to assess this, and we have to figure out exactly what we have. And then we have to generate a system, a logical system, of distributing these resources in a way that actually makes sense with respect to natural law. Instead, of course, of advertising and the unidirectional consumer good proposal system, which it is, that we have today where corporations basically tell you what you should buy. Hi, Billy Mays here for the original Quick Chop. In the words of Ludwig von Mises, you would be groping in the dark. You would face what is known as the knowledge problem of central planning. This is a figure from the fifth chapter of the book presenting five economic transitions. Automation, access, open source, localization, and networked digital feedback. And the final transition is digitized network feedback. A primitive form of this, so to speak, is now referred to as the Internet of Things, which I'm sure many have heard. So what is this Internet of Things and why should you care? And it's about networking technology and sensors to optimize information flows rather than just rely on price. How would you begin to make sense of that mountain of data? 
Well, here, the internet has been around for a while, but it's been mostly the product of people. So all the data and, and images and recordings and games, books and commerce and all of that was created by people, for people and about people. See, the internet is one of the most important and transformative technologies ever invented. They just don't know how to think about the solution or more accurately, how to arrive at such solutions. Please join me in welcoming Yvonne. I do love Mises to Pieces. So it's a, actually a real pleasure to be able to talk about Mises to you. Each one of these represents a more efficient mechanism to achieve higher productivity, reduced inequality, and have the least amount of waste and environmental impact. Um, and in fact, talk about an event that was quite defining for modern Austrian economics, which is something called the socialist calculation debate. The reason why comprehensive socialism inevitably fails. No, this model is a collaborative design system, CDS, not centrally planned. It is based entirely upon public interaction facilitated by programmed open source systems that enable a constant dynamic feedback flow. But in fact, this a notion of competing paradigms of centralization versus decentralization plays out in a variety of different digital technologies. One of the great myths of this model is that it is centrally planned. I'm sure many of us have heard that. Um, that, that was all hey, you know what, team? We've been here for a while. How about we order pizza? What this means, based on historical precedent, is that it is assumed that an elite group of people, basically, will make the economic decisions for a society. All right, so how do we want to do this? We order like a half pepperoni, half cheese? Uh, how about we get a full cheese, half pepperoni, and then quarter olives? I got it. One full olives, just total olives, and then one really small pepperoni and two extra large cheese. Uh, or, 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 or we do a whole fleet of pizzas. Half of those pizzas are half Brooklyn crust, half Chicago crust, and they're all two-thirds pepperoni and one-thirds cheese. Oh, just make sure we get one veggie pie, half cheese. That's all I ask. Eight pies, hear me out. On each one of those, okay, we've got one eighth cheese, one eighth veggie, one eighth stuffed cheese crust, no cheese. You see, this new internet is not just about connecting people, it's about connecting things. If any of these changes were actually applied, you would see a relative general public health improvement and ecological improvement systemically. Hey guys, guys, I got it, I got it. One eighth buffalo chicken, no cheese, no sauce. One eighth sausage, one eighth thin crust, Delaware style, then one eighth totally blank, raw dough. That's why I run into trouble with raw dough. Guys, 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 we're all executives. Let's just make an executive decision here. That can literally allow the input of the public on any given industrial matter whether personal or social. Eight deep dish meat lovers. But with veggie crusts. And no sausage, full onion. How did you get a job here? Well, there's a new internet emerging, and so it's named the Internet of Things. Interestingly, these five ideas are not obscure. They're not randomly idealized or pie in the sky. They're not pulled out of thin air. Anyone who's paid attention to current social and technological trends are aware of them. To understand Bitcoin's decentralization, I want to start with the caveat that decentralization almost always is not all or nothing. Almost no system is purely decentralized or purely centralized. And a good example of this is email, which is a decentralized system fundamentally, I would say. Um, we as human beings, we interact and contribute and collaborate with other people in our own environment through our five senses, and then add the ability to communicate. And that's where the Internet of People and the Internet of Things intersect. Which is a decentralized system, fundamentally, I would say. It's based on a standards-based uh, protocol, SMTP, but what has happened, especially uh, in the last decade or so, is that we see a dominance of a few different webmail providers, which are sort of centralized service providers. And this might be a good model for understanding what might be happening to Bitcoin. So what are some examples of these things? Well, let's start here. How about your smartphone? You wouldn't believe it how many senses your smartphone has. It knows where you are. It knows if you're moving. It knows how you're holding it. It knows how much light's in the room. As a result of all of this involvement in the economic calculation debate, 
what Hayek starts doing is really exploring the idea of knowledge. These five ideas are not obscure, but likely haven't thought about their broader implications in terms of public health. In March of 2009, that's when it bottomed out, I think GE was going to go bankrupt, just like General Motors went bankrupt. Or Today's economy is mostly driven by feedback from consumer purchases. GE was saved and a bigger bubble was inflated, but the fact that GE is down here should be you know, waving a warning flag. I mean, investors are very complacent. This is just another one of those dead canaries. People buy, business records this over the transaction, and production alters its designs and distribution to accommodate based on that feedback. It's a term uh, that someone named Ludwig von Mises coined years ago in opposition to anything of central planning and so on called the price mechanism. That's a massive amount of knowledge held by millions of people throughout society. How might you get it? It knows where you are. It knows if you're moving. It knows how you're holding it. It knows how much light's in the room. These are the basic rules of industrial action set by natural law, not human opinion. It knows how close it is to your face. It knows what you're saying to it, and it even has an eye so it can see its surroundings. If you just have some arbitrary person or some arbitrary supercomputer setting the prices, then those prices will not be a true reflection of the supply and demand relationship of consumers and producers. The number of production facilities, whether homogeneous or heterogeneous as they would be, be called, would be strategically distributed topographically based around population statistics. Now average cost, or the cost per unit, is the total cost divided by the number of output. The average cost of producing most things initially falls as more is produced. That's true for the production of almost everything. The more you make, each additional unit is eventually going to cost more. You're relating to industries. You're going to use things based only on your cost efficiency and the patterns you need. Uh, that's not the way a real economy would work. Real economy would take resources that we have and assess them for their scientific re relevance, assess them for what they're actually supposed to do, what their highest but efficacy is. But who does is. the assessment? And even if you could get complete and timely information about what everyone knows that's relevant to every use of steel and engineering, you would still need to deduce from it where to build the railroad. Chevy SS. So you have to make something. You're looking at numbers and cost efficiency. How much it costs to produce this? In the 20th century, price is now a very, very weak economic measure. In contrast, mechanisms related to this kind of so-called Internet of Things, the ability to connect everything and understand mass amounts of complicated information in a systems approach, obviously would be calculated by computers. We can monitor extremely efficiently consumer preference, demand, supply, planetary resources, labor value in terms of how difficult certain means are. And we can do this virtually in real time if a system was prepared. Everything is connected digitally, so we know what we have and what we're doing. Imagine that. Much of this information, by the way, is pretty much non-existent today because corporations have proprietary restrictions on the information they have. We really don't know anything about the hydrocarbon state of this planet, for example. We really don't know how many particular ores or how many diamonds or anything because it's, they're privileged to hoard this information, release it more at their competitive advantage than to actually be truthful. To assess the importance of a particular irrigation system, you would need to know what the farmers know about how irrigation would increase the yield of their fields. Let's say that's the car that the socialist planner wants to produce. Now let's look at the cost of production, the actual cost of producing things. And to know the value of that increased yield, you'd need to know what grocers know about their customers' eagerness for that produce. They will not be a true reflection of the intersubjective valuations of all of the people in that economy. Here's how it works. Just place the vegetable. With the public generally going with the flow, favoring one good component or feature. That means you get two of the original quick chops and two of the quick graders for only $19.99. Using price, of course, so they don't like something, then clearly they won't produce it anymore to weed out supply and demand. This system works the opposite way. The entire community has the option of presenting ideas for everyone to see and weigh in on and build upon. The actual mechanism of proposal will come in the form of an interactive design interface, such as we see with computer-aided design, or a CAD as it's called, or more specifically computed computer-aided engineering, which is a more complicated uh, synergistic process. And whatever isn't in, of interest simply won't be executed to begin with. There's no testing here, such as you would see with marketing, which is incredibly wasteful. It's as simple as that. Should he produce that automobile? Or would those, all those resources be better used to produce 20 motorcycles, which he also knows how to produce? 
You can easily get that from engineers and scientists and so on. That in turn depends on what customers know about the better meals they could fix with that produce. So if the owner of a pizza shop spends $10,000 on a brand new oven, the average cost of that very first pizza produced is going to be about $10,000. How would you find all this out? He doesn't know the answer to that. He doesn't know which good is more valuable, which is a more valuable use of those resources. You, you use up certain different resources, but there is no unitary cost. You the means of production refers to the non-human assets that create goods, such as machines, tools, factories, offices, and the like. In capitalism, the means of production is owned by the capitalist, by historical definition, hence the origin of the term. I bring this up because there has been an ongoing argument for a century that any system which does not have its means of production owned as a form of private property is just not going to be as economically efficient as one that has, or maybe not even efficient at all. This, as the argument goes, is because of the need for price, the price mechanism. And because of that, it will come up with the incorrect answers. It will, it will input the incorrect information into, the, into these calculations and thus come up with the incorrect answers as far as how to allocate resources. Price, which has a fluid ability to exchange value amongst virtually any type of good due to its indivisibility of value, creates indeed a feedback mechanism that connects the entire market system in a certain narrow way. Price is a way to allocate scarce resources amongst competing interests, for sure. Price, property, and money translate, in short, subjective demand preferences into semi-objective exchange values. I say semi because it is, again, a relative, culturally relative measure only absent most every factor that gives true technical consideration to a given material or good. In other words, it has nothing to do with what the materials or goods are, it's just a mechanism. Perhaps the only real technical data, in fact, I would say, that price embraces very crudely relates to resource scarcity and labor energy. Resource scarcity and labor energy. You can basically find that in price. In this context, the question becomes, moving on, is it possible to create a system that can, if not more efficiently, facilitate feedback with respect to consumer preference, demand, labor value, and resource or component scarcity without the price system, subjective property values, or exchange. And of course there is. Resource management, feedback, and value. And of course, if you're a free market mindset listening to this, you're likely going to object at this point by saying, problem is an information problem, or rather, a lack of information sources. Then the computer will pump out the incorrect answers. 50 would mark the steady state dividing line. For example, if the use of wood lumber passes below the steady state level of 50, which would mean consumption is currently surpassing the Earth's natural regeneration rate, this would trigger a counter move of some kind, such as, excuse me, the process of material substitution, hence the replacement for wood in any given future productions of finding alternatives. Hey guys, it's Amy. So I've built quite a freezer stash after pumping for 15 months, and now that Natalie is older and not drinking as much milk, I've been looking to other ways to use breast milk besides feeding. I know it might sound strange, but breast milk is packed with antibodies that have many healing qualities and can be used in countless other ways. How could you find out the urgency of need for engineering and steel in other uses? And it will not be able to allocate resources the most efficient way. Without price, how can you compare value of one material to another or many materials? Uh, in order to talk about these different types of energy resources, we need a, oftentimes a common denominator or a strain of uh, discussion that's common throughout. And the way we acquire that is that we convert the, um, the various different types into a common unit of measure. Uh, and that unit of measure compares the heat content of these different resources. In the United States and throughout much of, of the developed world, we use something called the British Thermal Unit or BTU and that's used to compare the heat content of different types of energy resources. Similarly, and this is critical, this design that's proposed to this system is filtered through a series of sustainability and efficiency protocols which relate to not only the state of the natural world, but also the total industrial system in as far as what is compatible. Processes of evaluation and suggestion would include the following. Strategically maximize durability, adaptability, standardization of genre components, strategically integrated recycling conduciveness, as I mentioned before, and strategically conducive designs themselves, making them conducive for labor automation. And so it does not matter how smart your supercomputer is. Durability just means to make the good as strong and as long-lasting as relevant. It does not matter. 
uh, the materials utilized, comparatively assuming possible substitutions due to levels of scarcity or other factors, would be dynamically calculated, likely automatically, in fact, by the design system to be most conducive to an optimized durability standard. Because if you, if you input the incorrect information, which you undoubtedly will. The assessment is done by reason. Because if you, if you input the incorrect information. So please don't confuse this with the idea that everyone just gets the same everything. What they get is the same basic sustainability principles, which come in many different forms. It would be like me saying, what is a spoon minus a doorknob? It's like a adding apples and oranges. Okay, it makes no sense. So if a car takes P tons of steel, Q hours of machine time, R hours of unskilled labor, um, hours of engineering labor, square feet of factory space, kilowatts of energy, gallons of paint, and so on, you cannot add those up. Simple. You organize genre, genre, genres, excuse me, or groups of similar use materials and quantify as best you can their related properties and degree of efficiency for a given purpose. Our energy resources come in all sorts of sizes and shapes and types. For instance, they can be solid, like coal and biomass. They can be liquid, like petroleum and water. And they can be gas, for instance, methane or natural gas, and even our atmosphere, in the case of wind. Uh, it doesn't have to be renewable or non-renewable for any particular type. Um, renewables as well as, renew as, well as non-renewables can be solids, liquids, and gases. And then you apply a general numerical value spectrum to those relationships as well. For example, there are a spectrum of metals which have different efficiencies for electrical conductivity. These efficiencies can be quantified. And if they can be quantified, they can be compared. The physical units of these particular energy resources are often used to measure how much we acquire and also how much we consume. So for instance, how many tons of coal were extracted, how many cubic feet of natural gas were burned, and how many kilowatt hours did that power plant down the road generate over a course of, say, a week, a month, a year, etc. So if copper goes below the 50 median uh, value regarding its scarcity, Calculations are triggered by the management program to compare the state of other conducive materials in its database, compare their scarcity level and their efficiency, preparing for substitution, and that kind of information goes right back to the designer. And naturally, this type of reasoning might indeed get extremely complicated, as again, uh, just numerous resources and numerous efficiencies and purposes, which is exactly why it's calculated by machine, not people. And it's also why it completely blows the price system out of the water when it comes to true resource awareness and intelligent management. Have anyone seen this thing called phone blocks? Where they're, yeah, brilliant. In the event a component part of this good becomes defective or out of date of any good, whenever possible, the design facilitates that such components are easily replaced to maximize full product lifespan. Standardization, standardization of genre components. All new designs either conform to or replace if they're updated, existing components which are either already in existence or outdated due to a comparative lack of efficiency. Many don't know this, but a man named Eli Whitney in 1801 uh, was the first to really apply standardization in production. He made muskets, and back then they were handmade, and you, they were uninterchangeable. So the musket parts, if, if anything broke, you couldn't take apart from something else. He was the first to actually make the tools to do this. And he basically started the entire process of standardization and, and the uh, U.S. military was now able to buy huge things of muskets and interchange them and, and much more sustainable even though they're killing people. <laughs> Which is interesting for the military because if you think about it, the military uh, is one of the most efficient systems on the planet because it's absent the market economy. This thing is, if you really want to look towards where industrial efficiency was born, I, as much as I dislike it, the military is, is where, it's, where it becomes. Uh, it's where it's been harnessed the most, excuse me. So anyway, this logic not only applies to a given product, it's applied to a, the entire good genre, standardization. And by the way, uh, this efficiency will never happen in a market economy with its basis in competition, as proprietary technology removes all such collaborative efficiency. No one wants that. No one wants to share everything like that. Otherwise, people wouldn't have a need to go back to their, their company of the root company and buy the part they would go somewhere else or they'd have access to it, no other means. Recycling conduciveness. 
As noted before, this means every design must conform to the current state of regenerative possibility. The breakdown of any good must be anticipated and allowed for in the most optimized way and made conducive for labor automation. This means that the current state of optimized automated production is directly taken into account, seeking to refine the process, excuse me, seeking to refine the design that's submitted to be most conducive to the current state of production with the least amount of human labor or monitoring. Again, we seek to simplify the way materials and production means are used so that the maximum number of goods can be produced with the least variation of materials and production equipment. It's a very important point. And these five factors are what we could call in total the optimized design efficiency function, if you want to be technical.